Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, this is the Developing Friendships webinar. It's actually the last in a series of webinars that uh, Autism Family Services of New Jersey has done for Autism Awareness Month. We kind of went into May, but we figured you can never have enough. Um, Autism Family Services is part of a large affiliate called the Family Resource Network, and I know many of you are familiar with our organization. Um, on the screen is our mission statement for tonight along with our website. Just a small reminder of some upcoming things with Autism Family Services. There is a deadline May 9th for those that may be um, looking for a college scholarship, students who are graduating high school with autism or um, uh, Asperger's or PDD, NOS. We have two $1,000 scholarships. That deadline is May 9th. You can visit the website for more specific details. It's a great resource for anybody you know who may be going on to post-secondary um, education or vocational school, so I thought I'd share that with you tonight. My name is Laura Hurley. I'll be the moderator. Um, your presenter tonight is Kristen Russell. She's the clinical manager at Above and Beyond Learning Group. She'll do an introduction of herself and her agency. Um, just very quickly, I am going to show you a slide that is your box that you have from GoToWebinar. Um, as you can see, that's the audio. If you're having a problem with audio, you want to make sure that your mic and speakers are clicked. And as the session goes on tonight, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions by typing it in that box. And I'll get those questions and I'll be able to share with Kristen as she goes on um, and does her presentation. So that's the basic of uh, the, the small introduction I have. I'm going to go ahead and unmute Kristen. Also, just so everybody knows, this session is being recorded. We will post the archive version later tonight. Um, actually, not tonight, but later during the week. So Kristen, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to you. I am going to make you the presenter so you can show your screen to everybody. Great. Thank you, Laura. You're welcome. Hello, and thank you for joining us today for Developing Friendships at Home, School, and in the Community. As Laura said, I'm Kristen Russell, Board Certified Behavior Analyst and Clinical Manager of Above and Beyond Learning Group. I wanted to thank Autism Family Services of New Jersey and Laura Hurley for hosting us today. Just a little bit about us. We, everything in ABA is a, an acronym, right? Um, so we call ourselves ABLG, or Above and Beyond Learning Group is one of the largest and most experienced private New Jersey Department of Ed approved organizations effectively treating and training professionals to work with children, adolescents, and adults with autism and other developmental disabilities and disorders. We provide best practice treatment, education, professional training, and mentoring throughout New Jersey. Our modality of treatment is ABA and we'll be offering speech services in the fall of 2014. ABLG offers a quarterly newsletter to keep you up to date on the most recent news in the world of autism and best practice in ABA. You can find that at www.ablgnews.org. If you'd like to check us out on the web, our website is www.ablg.org or on Twitter at ABLG Services. And on Facebook and LinkedIn, you can find us at Above and Beyond Learning Group. Today's objectives include reviewing the different types of social skills, affective behavior, verbal communication, and nonverbal communication. We are also going to review how social skills affect children's abilities to make friends and learn strategies to foster your child or children's social skills to increase his or her ability to make friends. So what are social skills and why are they so important? Social skills are an essential part of life, even beyond the obvious implications that with good social skills, a person can form meaningful relationships. Sometimes individuals with autism require extra help when it comes to reading people. Facial expressions and moods aren't so obvious to them. This is why it's important to teach at an early age when someone is happy, sad, angry, surprised, and so on. Children with autism need to know that, generally speaking, we should probably not approach someone who is angry because the person might, might need some space and time to calm down. They should also be aware that <clears throat> um, to have empathy to the extent possible for someone who is feeling sad because in that situation, laughing may not be appropriate. 
Another social skill is reciprocal conversation or that back and forth, that volleying in conversation, which can be taught. Even for individuals with autism who do initiate conversation with others, sharing a conversation with others can be difficult. Sometimes people only talk about their favorite subject instead of asking the other person questions. After all, quality relationships are not one-sided. If a person lacks social skills, it will be difficult to know how and when to approach someone or even ask for a drink of water, much less play board games with peers, participate in sports, get accepted to college, have and maintain a career, and be an active part of their community. So some things like eye contact, listening, following instructions, and giving and receiving feedback are all vital to be successful, for example, in the school setting. Be being able to ask to use the restroom, get a drink of water are very important. Learners who have had social skills training, such as raising their hand, waiting to be called on before answering a question, sitting quietly while the teacher is talking, have a much easier time navigating the classroom routine. Out in the community or in the workforce, getting to know people in the neighborhood or in their place of work can affect a success. Individuals with autism who have developed the social skills necessary to engage with people in the community and their workplace are set up to be successful. The ability to meet and have a conversation with people opens doors to career and higher education opportunities so that people with autism can prosper. The social skills we'll be reviewing today are affective behaviors, verbal communication, and nonverbal communication. In the following slides, we will review what those behaviors and forms of communication entail. Affective behaviors include things like hugs, kisses, holding hands, handshakes, high fives. However, for individuals with autism, understanding the idiosyncrasies behind when it is appropriate to engage in these behaviors and with whom can be daunting. It is important to teach skills such as reading body language and inferences that result in knowing whether or not there is consent to engage in affective behaviors or if the individual needs to request consent. For example, who do you hug? When is it appropriate to hug them? And do we need to ask if they would like a hug? Additionally, there are times that requesting to engage in affective behaviors with another person are inappropriate. We'll get into more detail about that later. So I want you to think about what affective behaviors are most important to your child or children. The reason I want you to do this is because we have to prioritize. As mothers, fathers, parents, or caregivers for children, adolescents, and adults with autism, we always want to do the most we, that we can. And we always want to do the best that we can for the people that we care for. It's really important that we don't frustrate the individual and that we don't burn ourselves out. So that's why I'm bringing it up. That's why we want to think about the affective behaviors that may be a struggle or the things that they're really good about. Laura, if you could bring up the first poll. Absolutely. Thank so you. So we're going to go ahead and launch the poll. Everybody should see a blue box. I'm going to give you a couple seconds to select one of the answers there. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. So, Kristen, I'm going to share the results. I don't think you can see them, but we have 28% of the attendees selected hugs. Okay. 0% at kisses. 28% at high fives. And the highest one was handshake at 39% and 6% were others. Okay, great. So what happens if thing go, things go wrong with these effective behaviors that you've talked about? Some children do not understand the idiosyncrasies of privacy, and teaching them about privacy, consent, requesting prior to engaging in a behavior, and things like that can really be a struggle for the children. For instance, I work with a student now who's 13. When he was 5, it was okay for him to climb in the lap of his caregivers. Now he's 13, about 5 foot 11, and I'd say about 175 pounds. Not quite so appropriate anymore. Not only is he much taller and much larger, he, and he also weighs more, um, he's 13 and hitting puberty. So it's not really appropriate for him to sit in his caregiver's lap anymore. And I know as a mom myself that we always want to love our children 
but it's not always appropriate, especially when we look at our children hitting puberty. If they don't understand what's going on with their body and what's appropriate and not, it can really affect them at school and in the community because they may try to climb in the lap of their teacher or with another student that they feel very close with, and that's not always okay. So moving on to verbal communication, which is another social skill. Um, verbal communication includes things like requesting joint attention, which is having attention not only to what you're talking about or playing with, but with your reciprocal partner, the person you're engaging with the activity or the conversation with. Um, also answering question, WH questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Reciprocal conversation, that volleying back and forth that we talked about. And expanding topic repertoires. Sometimes our kids get focused on something that they're very interested in, and that's all they'll really talk about. That's a great, great place to start with verbal communication, for instance, where their interest lies. But we also want to expand their topic repertoire and teach them how to ask about things that they'd like to learn more about or what their reciprocal partner is interested in. Otherwise, they get stuck in these routines that kind of makes it a little more rote and difficult for them to develop friendships. So again, just like with effective behaviors, I want, to think you about, I want you to think about the verbal communication skills that are most important for your children. So what happens when things go wrong with verbal communication? A lot of times the things that our children try to communicate gets lost in translation. So for instance, when I worked with a student, a male student, who said he wanted to be a girl, it wasn't so much about him wanting to be a girl, but the fact that he was always surrounded by women. His teachers were women, his siblings were girls, his mom obviously was a woman, and the classmates that related to him and were most empathetic were female. And that, so that's what he learned to relate to. It wasn't so much that he wanted to be a girl, but he understood girls more, better than he did boys. We have a lot of other things that go wrong with verbal communication. For instance, I worked with a few other students where the teachers taught them things that wouldn't necessarily be appropriate outside of the classroom. So the students like to touch women's hair or smell women's hair. And the teachers, thinking they were doing the right thing, taught the student to request first. So before the student would come up and touch a girl's hair or touch the teacher's hair, they would ask, can I touch her hair? But if you think about it, that's not really appropriate. Because if they overgeneralize that skill and go out into the community and approach a complete stranger and say, can I touch your hair, that's really inappropriate. So we have to be very cognizant of the things that we're teaching our children and how that can affect them. We always think about generalization and maintenance skills in the world of autism, but the generalization of some skills that we're teaching are actually setting our kids up for failure. The next social skill we'll talk about is nonverbal communication. It's another really important social skill for the, our children to learn, things like eye contact and gestures. As we get into more complex social skills like humor, sarcasm, and emotions, it's really important to teach what humor is, what sarcasm is, what emotions look like. <clears throat> so we'll start with eye contact. For me, this is a big one. I teach response to name and that when we call the child's name, they'll look. But for me, especially when teaching a new skill, I don't always require eye contact. It really is difficult for children on the spectrum to listen to what you're saying, compile what it is they're going to say, look at you, and also respond. There's so much competing sensory input that they have in addition to trying to figure out what they're going to say back. So to me, and what I've seen in the past 20 or so years working in the field, is that eye contact is something that comes as the, the child or the adolescent or adult becomes more comfortable with us. So that was my, <laughs> my little PSA on eye contact. Um, but to get back to nonverbal communication, for instance, humor, sarcasm, and emotions, they're more complex things to teach. A lot of times I've seen that our, our children have a sense of humor. It may not be similar to what some people are used to, but the, it's there. So how can we expand on that, and how can we set them up for success? Understanding sarcasm, for instance, is really difficult because sometimes our children's peers use sarcasm in a way that's degrading. 
And we really have to make them aware of when someone is being sarcastic and that's okay, and when someone's being sarcastic and it's actually kind of mean. Um, also for emotions identification, <clears throat> we talked a little bit about this, but um, so when do you approach someone who is angry? When do you ask that person if they're hurt or if they need help? Do you want to talk? The idiosyncrasies of nonverbal behavior are really difficult. And that's why it's essential that we teach skills to our individuals on the autism spectrum. So I'd like you to pick your top nonverbal communication skill that is most important to your child or children and think about prioritizing the top skill and the things that you would like to see them improve upon in the nonverbal in nonverbal communication. Laura, can you bring up the second poll, please? Absolutely. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and launch it. So you guys should be experts now in the polls. <laughs> I'll give you a couple seconds to click on your choice. All right, I'm going to close it in five seconds. All right, we're closing, and I'm going to share it, and I'll read the results out loud to you. So eye contact was the highest at 44%, followed by body language at 33. Gestures was at 15, and humor and sarcasm were both at 4%, Kristen. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So what happens if things go wrong with nonverbal communication? A lot of times children on the autism spectrum don't read the facial expressions and the body language of the people they're conversing with or the people they're surrounded with. And they receive a lot of rejection through life. So eventually they stop trying. That's really sad, but also it's really an issue that we as caregivers, educators, and parents need to address. So how do you take a learning history where someone has been rejected and make it something that they want to do? That again becomes intrinsically motivating. It can be really difficult, but now we're going to talk about how to rectify that situation. Um, before I move on to the next section, are there any questions that you have? If you could type them in the box, Laura, if you have any input on how to do that better. Yeah, and I know that one person has said her audio is going in and out, so we will archive the session. Um, and unrelated to some of the topics you talked about, um, we did have an attendee ask if you would be willing to share your PowerPoint after the session that we could email out to everybody. Absolutely. Um, so, so far there are no specific topic questions. Okay. Do you want me to just forward my PowerPoint to you? Yep, you can forward me the PowerPoint tomorrow. Tomorrow, That would be fine, and we'll email it out to everybody that's logged on. We have everybody's emails. Okay, great. Thank you. So no questions so far? No questions so far, but just so everybody knows, there is that questions box. Oh, wait, we do have some questions. We have one. Do you have any input about head bud budding? Do you have any input about headbutting? Head so I guess, you know, a child that might headbutt somebody. It depends on why they're headbutting. My son finds comfort with hitting his head um, hard against um, bodies. Okay. So um, I have a that that, clarification to the question. <laughs> in that situation, I would say, is there a way that we can find that will give him that same input, um, that we can give him non-contingently or he doesn't have to earn it, he just gets it, as a way to reduce the amount of headbutts that he's giving to other people where he can headbutt something that's more appropriate if it's that pressure that he's looking for. Um, I know that some in some schools they use like a, a foam um, pad, pillows, that sort of thing, um, and really something that's going to give him that same sort of input so that he's not seeking it out with other people. 
Okay. Do you want to keep moving on? And then um, it looks like there's a couple more questions coming in, or do you want me to ask them, or you want to wait? Um, we can answer them now. That's fine. Okay. So the next question says, my son had a core... I'm sorry, I'm going to make it larger so I can actually read the whole thing at once. <laughs> My son had a core group of friends that he hung out with. We can't seem to figure out why they stopped hanging out with him, and information is not easy to get out of him since he's 13. Um, nope, he has, uh, he has issues with becoming obsessive with conversations that really only two things he's interested in. Is there anything that we can do to help him get past that? I definitely, as we go on, it does give some ideas about how we can expand topic repertoire and kind of, so outside of what he's obsessing over, why it's important, and then also that reciprocal and back and forth conversation and not just dominating the conversation. Um, so that's something we'll address as we, we go forward. And if I don't, um, there's also question and answer at the end of the session, so you can ask for more specific clarification then as well. Okay, okay. and um, there is a question about how to teach skills to kids that m the kids may have rejected in the past and, has, and have stopped trying. Any suggestions on how to get past that? Um, that's actually what we're gonna, going to go into next. So again, if I don't specifically answer it in the next um, few slides, then feel free to ask again at the, the next question and answer sort of. Well, I think portion. that leads us into your next section perfectly then. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. So how do we teach these skills? Um, the way that we can do that is by the use of preference, the use of choice, and prioritizing. Preference is a tool we can use <clears throat> that can be used to determine what is possibly in itself motivating to help foster friendships. So this is really a place to help with that nonverbal communication and rejection that we talked about before. Using preference makes facilitating friendships easier by pairing the preferred item or activity with a non-preferred or difficult activity or skill. A lot of times when we are trying to build friendships between the child and peer, we begin with the learner's preference because we have to pair the relationship. Just like as a professional, I have to pair myself with each of the students that I work with or each of the learners that I work with. <clears throat> it's really important that you pair peers with your child. What that means is really that we're hanging out. And if you want to watch a movie, we'll watch a movie. If you want to have a snack, we'll have a snack. There are really no demands placed at this point. You just want to be around the child and want the peer to be around them so they know there aren't going to be any demands placed. These peers are fun and I want to be around them. This can be difficult, but again, pairing really helps build a relationship so that the learner knows that they're going to have fun with their peer. That's really important, especially in the beginning when you're forming the friendships. So what does your child prefer? If it's reading, you may want to start a peer book club with books that your child really likes and then move into things that the peers prefer. You want to then bring in a whole new realm that neither the learner nor the peers have heard of. It's all about utilizing the preferred activity. And then as they're accepting that and wanting to do that, you introduce the less preferred or the peers preference and then non-preferred activities. Um, if your child likes movement, you can teach him or her sports, tag, chase, any of those types of games, depending on their age, obviously. As they get older, it could be manhunt or um, something like that. It can be a really good way and a use to teach replacement behaviors as well. Um, if your child is really into a specific character, a specific show, you can make home movies with figurines that he or she likes. And the peers kind of get into that too because they're very into technology and learning through technology and movies. So that's going to be a commonality between both your child and the peer. If, there, if, if your child's into music, you can teach them to dance. And if your child is able to, teach them the words to the song. I know that when we're having a difficult time teaching, for instance, 
um, just some social questions, using song has really helped a lot of learners that I've worked with. Um, if they like watching TV, you can teach them to make, again, home movies, or you can videotape outings that you go on with peers. If your child loves the computer or iPad, teach them to take video, Skype, FaceTime, family and friends. You can edit different activities and make them into home movies. We'll go a little bit more into that um, a little bit later when we talk about vignettes um, of different people that I've worked with. Um, if your child's into jumping, you can teach hopscotch, jump rope, jumping on the trampoline. These are just some ideas. I wanted to get you thinking about what you can use based on your child's preference to make it functional for them, and then you can include the peers as well. So let's get some discussion going, or polls going again. Tell me a little bit about your child's preferences. Laura, if you can bring up the next poll. Yep, and this is our last one for the night, so I'm going to go ahead and launch it. And now you guys really should be experts on the poll. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll give you about 35 seconds to submit your answer. I can tell people are getting more comfortable with the polls because the, the number of responses have increased. <laughs> Great. I tried to figure out a way to do some participant interaction, um, so I thought the polls would work. Absolutely. Well. So five more seconds. Fantastic. I'm going to go ahead and close it. I'll share the results and read them out loud to you, Kristen. So we have music, 27%, 7% for movement. The biggest one was 63% with technology, and 3% was other. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. So that will really make a difference when we come to the vignettes again as I, a little bit later in the presentation because we talk about a lot about diff different ways to utilize technology with peers um, and the things that you can do to kind of foster friendships by utilizing that. So when teaching any skill, the use of choice is extremely important. The ability to decide to perform one of several acts or to avoid an action entirely can enhance or hinder, in, hinder the teaching, especially in this instance for our purposes, teaching and developing friendships. If you think about it, as adults, we make up to something like 35,000 choices per day. Whether we want to hit the snooze button in the morning or if we want to get up with the alarm, um, how we want to do our hair as women, what makeup to wear in the car, do we vote up? want to put on the radio, what station do we want to listen to. In a world where our children are told who, what, when, where, why, and how to do something, it's really important to use choice because it gives them a sense of control. If we look at choice making as a skill, we can use natural reinforcement to achieve closer and closer approximations to use it in fostering friendships for a child. What that means is that we're going to shape the behavior to get closer and closer to the skills that we want to see the child engage in, breaking the skill down into small components to eventually learn how to complete the total skill. The benefits of using choice are increasing independence, providing new opportunities, the ability to show preference, which may be ever-changing within seconds, minutes, sometimes days, sometimes weeks providing a sense of control and decreasing problem behaviors. Excuse me. The types of choices we can offer our children are between activities. Do you want to play a board game or watch TV within activities? If they're doing some sort of arts and crafts, do you want to use colored pencils or markers? Who you're going to engage in the activity with, where, when, how long, and the choice not to. That's really a choice that a lot of parents and professionals professionals alike struggle with because the learner does have that opportunity, but a lot of times the learners are required to participate and engage in the activity that we're asking them to. So utilizing between or within activity choice gives the learner the sense of control because they have to do it, but at least they have choice within it. So in a world where the children are in school, vocational program, or at work for six or more hours a day, they don't have a lot of control. 
if we think of the the same the time the same as we think of our work time, it gives us a reference of the decreased amount of choice that our children actually have. Add on top of that issues with expressing wants and needs, emotions, difficulties making choices, the rejection they have felt in social situations, it can really take a toll. The use of choice is a really good tool and strategy to use to help children develop friendships. On a side note, for those learners who have difficulty making choices, using a choice board, whether uh, pictures or written cues, can help them increase opportunities to make choices. Teaching strategies that we use include having the activity ready. A lot of times waiting isn't an option, and from a clinical perspective can escalate behavior. You want to also provide multiple opportunities because the more the child practices, the better they're going to get. You want to plan times in your child's day to have him or her make choices around developing social skills and fostering friendship. And reinforcement. We all know as a behavior analyst, I had to throw that in there, right? Um, Learners need to be reinforced with highly preferred objects or activities to increase the likelihood they're going to engage in the behavior again. Even working with token systems or behavior charts so that they can receive the reinforcement for doing well. And remember, doing well changes. We want to shape the behavior to look more and more like the skill where you're trying to teach. If you think ahead and you're on your toes, you can see precursors to problem behaviors or you, you can <clears throat> see a problem behavior start to escalate, think how, when, and where can I offer choice. Pre-planning will make a big difference for you. If your child has difficulty making a choice, um, build in a visual aid. Activity schedules, picture cues, written cues, written schedules. This will really help with decreasing frustration and allowing the child to be aware of the expectations and support them in their times of difficulty. And you also want to make sure to utilize the communication system that your child is most fluent with, whether that's speech, an AAC device like a Dynavox, or on the iPad, the ProLoco Pro to go, tap to talk, text, or sign language. The do's and don'ts of choice making. We do want to plan choice making into fostering friendships. Preparation is always key because as much as we prepare, it's much easier to modify on the fly when you have something set in place. A lot of times, what we prepare for isn't always what happens. Planning and preparation will allow you to modify on the spot much quicker, whether it's with turn taking or sharing, reciprocal conversation, playing a board game, your planning and preparation will help you in being more confident about what to do when the situation arises. And remember that we all change our minds sometimes. Allowing our children the same opportunity is only fair. We don't want to allow continuous access to changing your mind. One, maybe two times would be okay, but changing their mind every minute and a half to two minutes is not all that appropriate. We don't always want to offer choice. Sometimes it's not appropriate. For instance, in issues of safety, we always want to keep our learners safe. So it's really important that when we can't offer choice because it's a safety issue, that we have choice built into other areas. Do we have any questions? We do have a couple questions. Um, so the first one says, our son says no to almost all the preference, um, all the preference of choices. How do you engage him in this case? And I think you went over some of those strategies. This question might have been asked before you went over that, but just in case. <laughs> okay. The other thing is, what are the things that he prefers to do on his own time? So, if he likes to play video games, if he likes to read books, if he likes to um, play the different, all those different games that are on all the handheld devices, Temple Run, um, Angry Birds, any of those things. Um, whatever he prefers to do, even in his alone time, that's where we can start and kind of go back to that pairing piece that we talked about um, so that there's no demand place and it's, it's his preference and we're just hanging out and doing, you know, whatever it is that he wants to do. And then we did have a question going back to your verbal communication slides. Um, somebody asked if we were going to do a poll on verbal communication. Um, 
and I did say that we were not, but they were interested in reciprocal conversation skills. So mm -hmm. I'm guessing along the lines of how to increase those reciprocal conversation skills. Right, and in this part, portion, we're going to talk about vignettes, so I'll talk about the specific ways that we program that for different age children. Okay, and then the last question, when my son is given a choice whether it's between two items or more, he starts to get very emotional and says he's confused and doesn't understand how to choose. If they are all things he doesn't like or when it's between things he does like, how can we help him um, when this happens? And how do we limit choice changes that happen multiple times at once? Um, for the choices, I would say if the actual objects or activities or things that he has the choice between, if you put them in front of him, and in that forced choice kind of a situation where there's you can have this or this, and actually put the objects in front of him, that may help um, with a choice or um, utilizing the um, choice boards may be helpful. Um, if the picture representation isn't helping, the object may, if that clarifies. It does. And I, there was another question in there I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, well, the person responded, thank you. So you must have answered the, all of the question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Kristen. Now we're going to discuss different situations that I've been in when fostering friendships. All the vignettes I will present today are based on real situations, however names, diagnoses, etc. have been changed to disguise true identity. So Isabella was the three-year-old girl diagnosed with PDD and OS. She loves music and her mother reported that she had a hard time getting Isabella to wear certain clothes, follow routines, request her wants and needs, and wait for what she wants what she wanted. Um, Isabella's mother was also concerned that she did not play with her siblings or other children. So we started by pairing her peers and siblings with her. So doing fun activities that Isabella really enjoyed. Once she was tolerating her peers and siblings in those activities, we started a requesting program. At school, during snack time, the peer had a snack and she would have to request the item from them. So for instance, if she had fruit snacks, she would request fruit snack, and the peer would deliver the fruit snack to her. We also worked on play schemes, how to play appropriately in the centers at school or with her toys at home, whether it was dolls or a library set up or the veterinarian. We also worked on sharing. Um, Isabella would have the object first, and then the timer would go off, and her sibling or peer would say, it's time to share, and she would have to give the toy to the peer or her sibling. We started with really small increments of time, like 10 seconds, that she would have to give up the toy. And when she was tolerating that and not engaging in problem behaviors, we would increase the time to 15 seconds, then 30 seconds, and so on. So sharing increased in time. And then we also worked on waiting. We didn't actually introduce waiting until she was requesting her wants and needs independently and consistently, and we wanted her to know that her words had meaning. The way we do this is by honoring requests every time that they're made, unless it's a safety issue. So once she was requesting independently and consistently at a rate of two requests per minute, we introduced waiting as a way to delay gratification. We did that by starting with pairing the word wait with receiving the desired item and activity. We moved on to two seconds, four seconds, and increased the time until she was waiting for up to half of the school day or three hours at home. On a side note, many parents and caregivers ask me what they should do when they want to restrict something. For example, if the learner has eaten a bunch of candy and wants more, they don't want to continue to give candy. In that situation or a similar situation where you feel a need to put limitations on their requests, you can. It's just a matter of setting the limit. So for example, if the learner requests candy and you only want them to have one piece, for whatever your reason may be, you could say, here's your candy, but then we're done. Or you can have one piece of candy or something similar. So what else could we have done? What I want you to think about is how this applies to your child. And what else do you need to help support your child? 
to get them to be able to access what they need or teach them in order to develop friendships. So for instance, when Isabella was in school, we had her deliver reinforcement to her friends. They all had a behavior chart and they earned stickers when they did something well in class. Specifically, they focused on doing nice things and caring for their peers. Isabella actually became a star student and was very mothering and nurturing to all of her friends. She became very empathetic and would go over to her peers when they were upset and rub their back to tell them it was okay. She would deliver their stickers and tell them how well they were doing. Isabella actually went from a self-contained preschool disabled classroom to an inclusion classroom to a mainstream classroom in less than a year. Think about how this could apply to your child, and if it doesn't, we have other vignettes that may help you. So Mason's a seven-year-old boy diagnosed with autism. He loves to play on his iPad and watch High School Musical. He's a purple belt in judo, attends swimming lessons, and loves his family. He has difficulty requesting his wants and needs, and does not have many friends, and has difficulty with loud noises. We ran a requesting program, which is a little bit different from Isabella's, in that we had him requesting his wants and needs from the adults in his life, myself, the aide in his classroom, his teacher, and his parents. Once he was fluent with that, we moved into requesting from his siblings and peers. We did a lot of pairing with his peers, just having Mason tolerate <clears throat> his siblings and peers in his presence. Once the peers and siblings were paired, we worked on turn-taking with Box, Play-Doh, and different activities that he really enjoyed. He also really liked um, markers and whiteboard. Uh, he also loved to be chased, and we started with having his peers chase him, and his re reinforcement was actually the peers catching him and tickling him. And once he was fluent with that and requesting chasing from his peers, we moved on to tag, so that it became a reciprocal game that Mason really enjoyed. For Mason, we taught him to introduce himself, greet others when new people entered the room, or when he saw familiar people in the hallways, and also to join in a group. He had a difficult time with all of those things. For introducing oneself and greeting others, we actually had to use scripts because he had a really difficult time. Once we, we used the scripts, Mason was actually able to stop using them and engage in novel communication which is really the goal of using scripting, scripted conversation. So here is an example of how to teach some different social skills. You know what, Kristen, we're having a little bit of problem with the audio of the video. Um, okay. So maybe, is the volume on, on the video okay for you? Maybe increase that a little bit? Okay. Let's try that. Okay. I know originally I asked you to turn your volume down so there wouldn't be feedback on my end, but maybe we just need to turn it up now. Okay. Um, let me see if I can get back to where we were. Sorry. Okay. Is that better? I could hear it a little bit. Turn it up a little bit more. Okay. Can you hear it now? Um, play it a little bit longer. I could hear a, a second of it. No, Is that better? Some, no, for some reason the volume's not working on it. Okay. Well, basically, um, what that was showing was, um, <clears throat> that in introducing 
oneself, allowing for self-correction and time to process. And then when she was joining the play, that the person working with her primed her and set her up, told her what she needed to do, modeled for her, had her practice before she actually went into the situation and requested to join her peer in play. And then the one that you didn't see was um, having responding to someone asking to join the child's play and how to do that. So that's what those videos were. I apologize that they didn't work. Um, hopefully that's the next few will. Um, I think we have one or two more, so if they don't, just let me know. Well, and if we can't get them to so work... for Kanye and Carly... And if we can't get them to work... Mm -hmm. We'll post the links on our website when we do the archive so people can go to the link to the web to the video as well. Great. Thank you. So for Kanye and Carlos, um, they were two middle school boys that attended a self-contained class. Kanye enjoyed drawing, telling sci-fi stories, and talking to his teachers. He expressed his frustration by yelling, punching, kicking, and throwing things at others. He had few friends. Um, Carlos enjoyed watching movies, telling jokes, and talking to girls his age. Carlos engaged in self-stimulatory behavior when he got excited about something. So what we did in their classroom was to start a social skills group. Um, what that did was allow them to practice the behaviors that they needed help with, like dealing with losing, making a mistake, dealing with anger, expressing frustration um, within the self-contained classroom. And that carried over to a peer buddies group where their peers from the general ed classroom would come in for two periods per, excuse me, two days a week, and they would play together. Um, Obviously, that's a little different setup than as a parent or a caregiver, but you can think of setting up peer buddy groups um, in your home, getting volunteers from extracurricular activities that your kids are involved with, um, anyone from their class um, that you can have over to your house for um, to hang out or play dates, obviously, depending on the age of your, your child. Um, so getting back to Kanye and Carlos, um, when the peer buddies would come down, they're in seventh and eighth grade, um, they played foosball, played games on the computer, and worked on generalizing the skills they learned in the social skills group. The teacher in the classroom also created an awesome language arts activity that both boys, um, Kanye and Carlos, <coughs> were really very into. Um, they both liked the movie The Avengers, so they made a movie with ac the action figures from The Avengers. They recorded the video without sound, and then they edited the movie, which had over four hours of video. Carlos and Kanye did the voiceovers for the movie. And on a side note, Carlos, um, the, the voiceovers were inadvertently helpful. Um, when I started working in the classroom, you couldn't hear Carlos speak even when you were sitting right next to him. But using this editing program for the voiceovers, it showed you how well your voice was being recorded. So red was not at all, yellow you were still too low, and green your voice was loud enough to be recorded well. Without any intensive teaching, just using the editing program for their language arts um, activity, you s could actually hear Carlos across the room when he was speaking after it was done. That was just an added bonus to making the movie. Um, Kanye also really enjoyed it and did the voiceovers as well. Outside of that, the teacher facilitated having Carlos and Kanye go to the movies together on their free time, and both boys really enjoyed that and did it several times over the years that I worked with them. The other things that um, we worked on Kanye with were to have him create social stories with staff about how he could deal with his frustration, what he could do instead of becoming aggressive, who he could talk to, what he would request, because that really kind of um, stagnates developing friendship process when you're aggressive. Um, we also worked on having him ask for breaks. Um, in the the school setting, he went for walks, and he was able to navigate the school without having any inappropriate behaviors. And breaks are a great tool 
to allow them to escape the situation but still access what they're, they're looking for, that reinforcement that they're looking for. Um, we could have also worked on requesting attention from their peers, um, doing scripted or reciprocal conversation to increase the amount of language they were using, the topics they were talking about. Those are just some of the other things that we could have done. If you feel these things could be applicable to your child, great. If not, we have more examples um, on how to develop friendships. Another great technology to use um, in kind of teaching any sort of social skill and that being very much part of developing friendships is the use of a social story. This is actually an example of a social story I used for a student that I worked with. He would laugh when other people got hurt. Um, so that really put his potential friends off because he was laughing when they were hurt, whether they were physically hurt or emotionally having a hard time. And basically what a social skill, what a social story does is give the child options of what he or she can do instead of engaging in the inappropriate behavior. A social story states how the child feels or what their reaction is and the alternatives or replacement behaviors that he or she can engage in. When you teach a social story, typically you want to have them read it two to three times a day, priming them by reading it right before going to the activity that leads to the inappropriate behavior or a situation where you know that it may happen and having the child role play when they're calm to practice the skill so that they can become proficient. So here is another video model that I thought would be informative and helpful. This may give you ideas about how to foster friendships with your child. And Laura, let me know if the video doesn't work well for this, or the audio rather. Kristen, it seems that the, we're having a problem with the audio and videos. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so that was just basically uh, pure models show, that demonstrate how to be a friend in middle school. Um, and I'll give that link as well so that you can access that if you'd like to see that. Um, so to move on, um, I worked with a girl who, who is a Suzanne, 15 years old, diagnosed with ADHD and bipolar disorder. She had a beautiful singing voice and performed a solo in her school's winter concert. She loved to talk about her favorite things and ask about others' preferences, but she had difficulty talking about things that she did not like or know a lot of information about. So what could we do? We did a lot of different things, but the one I want to talk about is video modeling. You can make your own about what your child should do and make a video of them doing it or utilize a peer. Suzanne really enjoyed watching herself on video, and you may have to set it up where the learner is at first or your child is at first reading the script, but it's showing them the appropriate behavior and the behavior that you're looking for in developing friendships. Um, that could be reciprocal conversation, that could be so they're taking turns and not dominating the, the situation. Um, the next video model was just about that. So you would show this to your child so they know not to, to dominate the conversation and what gives them perspective about how they're Part, the communicative partner feels if they dominate that situation. Um, <clears throat> okay, so moving on, I'll give that um, video link as well. So for Vance, he was a 20-year-old diagnosed with Asperger's. He is very interested in meeting and dating girls. However, after approaching them, talking to them, inviting them out on dates, he really had no success. The first thing we started with was the hygiene checklist. Vance didn't really like to take a shower or brush his teeth and sometimes wore the same clothes, especially socks, numerous times. He didn't always smell that great and we told him that girls like a guy who looks good and smells good. 
So creating the hygiene checklist and the fact that he knew girls wanted someone who looked good and smelled good, he was very motivated to do his hygiene checklist. Um, we also had to teach Vance how to read social cues. When you're trying to meet and date someone, there are many idiosyncrasies that people with Asperger's don't always understand. Um, for about three months, there was a girl at school that would wave to him, or she would wave first and he would reciprocate, but that's all that would happen. So we taught him that he could go up and say hi, but he was very nervous about doing that. After about a week, he was comfortable and would say hi back, and we coached him to start a conversation with her. But he wasn't sure what to talk about, so we role-played what he could talk about to her. And since they were at school together, he knew that they were both taking classes, and that's where we suggested that he start. We role-played a lot of situations and possibilities of what she could say and how he could respond. So he went up and introduced himself and talked about the different classes they were taking. They had different conversations for about a month, and then we coached him about how to ask her out on date. He really liked her. And they did end up dating for a few months. However, when they first started dating, Vance wanted to show her how much he liked her, and he would text her every time he thought about her. It became really overbearing for her because Vance would text her close to 300 times a day. So we had to talk to Vance about the legal aspects of that and what texting someone 300 times a day could be seen in the, the eyes of the law um, because it can actually be considered stalking. So we taught Vance the appropriate amount of times to text her and setting those limits for him, he was able to um, still show her that how much he liked her, but he knew that he only had to do it a few times a day and not every time he actually thought of her. Role plays are a great teaching tool to utilize. Um, <clears throat> you can have your child demonstrate or go through the situations that could happen. There are so many different situations that happen with one topic, so you want to run them over and over again with multiple scripts, practicing it more than one way. Um, practicing in all different ways because that's really life. The way I would respond to someone who came up to me and started a conversation about sports is way different than the way my son would respond to a situation about sports or the way that another person who has more information about sports would re respond. So you really have to try to plan for all those situations and practice them. One, so the child doesn't become real and only respond one way, and two, because they need to know that things are going to change and it's not always going to be the same conversation. So practice is really important. There are so many things that impact making friends, and this presentation could go on and on probably for multiple days if we talked about all of them. But the three things that I'd like to stress that are really important to teach <clears throat> children with autism from a young age are understanding body language, figurative speech, and idioms, and slang terms. A lot of times we end up teaching little gentlemen and ladies, and we're very particular about manners. But things that are funny to kids and teens are often offensive to adults. But this is what's going to make them more accepted by their peers. For instance, my son thinks that farts and burps are hysterical. And to many adults, it may not be appropriate. But when you're with your peers, you want and you want for your child to be able to relate and for the, the peers to be able to re relate to them. The fact that they think it's funny, it's okay. That's typical of any child. Boys think farts and burps are funny. Um, you just have to teach your child about the boundaries and what are acceptable situations to talk about or do things like that. So in this slide, understanding body language, it's actually replicated from Lifespan Behavioral Services. Um, they wrote this program and how to teach it. It's adapted from the hidden curriculum by Michelle Garcia Winner. And the objectives basically are to present a model of body language, posture, and a verbal direction. What that means is if I, <clears throat> I have shown my child a scowl on my face, they have to tell me what that means. Having our child identify what it means when people have different from body language postures is essential. If your head is leaning to one side or you're nodding, it means you're listening, interested, or thinking. If the corners of your mouth are lifted up and you're smiling, you're happy. 
or it may be a nonverbal greeting as you're passing someone. If I have it my hands on my hips, that could mean I'm frustrated, bored, questioning, expecting an answer, especially as a mother. Um, some of the, our children need to have these things taught to them. Not only do they need to know what they're reading on other people, they also need to be able to show that they are bored, frustrated, happy, and interested. You want your child to be able to show you and also have the prerequisites of doing this, which is imitation of body language postures, imitation of expressive responses required, and emotions, recognition, or identification. So you want to assume that the target body language is something that the learner is able to observe, recognize, and respond to and demonstrate. Another key part of this is to use multiple exemplars. And what that means is to use multiple teaching materials. You might want to do it with numerous people in your family, use cartoons, movies, pictures in the magazine, YouTube. Um, that's one of my favorites, obviously, um, for incidental and natural environment teaching. The way I express listening or anger or doubt is different from the way someone else does. So the, our children are going to need to be able to recognize it across people in different environments. And the easiest way to access that really is through the internet. For figurative speech and idioms, it can be really difficult for a child with autism to understand them. Um, some children on the spectrum think in very concrete terms. If you said something like, you're in hot water, they may be picturing in their head a pot of boiling water and someone sticking them in that. If it's not taught, it's difficult for people with autism to understand what in hot water means for instance, when they're in a difficult situation or being disciplined. If someone said to your child, wow, the teacher really bit my head off, he could possibly be envisioning this big mouth coming over and taking their head off with one bite. In actuality, we know that the peer meant that the teacher was speaking to them in a quick or angry way for no reason. There are so many different types of figures of speech and idioms, and we've listed a few here to make you start thinking about them, but it's really important to teach these things because your child will hear it throughout their lives, and the more they know, the more able and ready they're going to deal with these situations. And understanding slang terms, it's essential in peer acceptance. For these terms, I actually had to go to parents and professionals who were parents and ask them to pull their own children to tell me slang terms that they use, because I'm not so up with the signs anymore. Um, just chill and shut up, get out, I get that, and what that means. Um, but I had no idea what sick, twisted, tight, and swag those slang terms meant. Um, so what you want to do is actually have your children's peers or siblings that are of the same age drive the targets that you're going to teach. If your children say things that are out of context, they're not going to be see received as well. And we want our children to be appropriate in the use of slang terms and skilled in the comprehension of slang terms within the situation. You don't want them to not understand or make a comment that's out of context. Children need to be taught to readily understand and replicate their peers. So this slide contains the resources and references that I used to develop this presentation and the programming that I've used with learners to promote social skills friendship development. It's a list of great resources for you to utilize, and you'll get that um, in the PowerPoint presentation. So thank you for allowing me to present to you, and I hope that you have found it helpful. I'll answer any questions that you have at this time. Sure, we actually have quite a few right now. So the first one is a pretty easy one, Kristen. Can you mm -hmm. just give the reference again for understanding body language? The reference was The Hidden Curriculum by Michelle Garcia Winner. Okay. And the next question is, how do you teach that change in schedules can happen in order to calm a student down? How can you teach the change in schedules happen? Um, we actually have, I've, what I've done is practiced it um, and left in the schedule, oh, this changed, and so we switched their, their written schedule or their picture schedule. 
and reinforced right away so that they're calm, they, ha they haven't engaged in any maladaptive behavior. And the other thing that I've done with another student is was, um, was to actually leave the, the schedule to be more um, vague. So it wasn't so specific and wouldn't necessarily evoke um, different challenging behaviors. And um, the next question, what social skills curriculum would you recommend for teaching social skills for middle and high school students that are easy to implement in schools? Um, easy to implement in schools? It's, uh, I kind of take from Jeb Baker, um, his social skills training, and also um, Isabel Hanel has a great um, a great program as well, and I kind of pull from all of them and create my own to best suit the needs. Okay, um, so this is this is going back to young boys. <laughs> my son is almost. <laughs> My son is almost seven, and when he has to fart, he'll walk up to you, bend over, and stick his butt in the air and ask if it smells no matter where we are, home or out in public. How do we get him to understand to stop without him getting upset or offended? Um, I would say that it, it depends on what our reaction is when he's doing that to us. Um, and then also the social story would be a great way to teach him that it's not appropriate and you practice that in times where he's not farting on you in public um, and review why so that we start to kind of internalize and intrinsically um, know that how it makes other people feel when we ourselves may not be that empathetic to the feelings of other people. And can you give any ideas on how to improve eye contact? Um, the way that I've utilized it for younger learners um, was to use their reinforcers and bring them up to my eye. If they still would divert gaze, then I would bring it over my head. And when you get to the back of your head, kind of right above that bump um, that's below your crown, um, they actually give you eye contact, and then I would give the reinforcer right away with behavior-specific praise saying, great job looking. Um, the other thing that I've done is it, <clears throat> for kids, for instance, who really love puzzles, having them request for the puzzle pieces and taking the puzzle piece and doing the same thing, um, bringing it up to my eye so that they're looking at me when they're talking. Okay. Um, next question, how do you go about reconnecting relationships that have failed in the past? That depends. Is it they failed and your child doesn't want to engage in them again, or they failed um, and the other person doesn't want to? Mm. So... I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> no, like, I don't. But I, I would say it would definitely depend if it was because it failed on your child and there's something we could do about it. But if it failed because the other person doesn't want to resume the relationship, then we have to be respectful of their decision um, and try to possibly find other people to develop friendships with. Okay, and then the last question I have of the night is actually not pertaining to this topic, Kristen, but maybe you can offer her a resource where she can go to. Um, she has a preschooler that has been diagnosed with Asperger's but um, feels it may be autism. Um, you know, she's, she doesn't know how to address him, and when she does address him, um, doesn't, doesn't know if her child is understanding her. Um, mm -hmm. Any recommendation on resources she could go to to, to flesh that out a little bit more? Um, and did, did she say how old? Um, preschool. Oh, preschool, right. Um, I would say a neurodevelopmental pediatrician that's um, a provider in network through your insurance would probably be your best bet. Okay. And that is all our questions for the night, Kristen. 
So thank you so much. Do you have anything else to add? I don't. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. It was a great session. We will make sure that we post the links to your videos. I apologize to everybody that the audio did not work. Um, we thank everybody for joining us tonight. The session has been recorded. So um, we will post it next week on our website. And I hope everybody has a good night. Thank you.